Hello guys, I am back with another video and today, we will talk about Howard Hughes. Before there was Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein, there was Howard Hughes. He was an American business magnate, record-setting pilot, engineer, film producer, and philanthropist, known during his lifetime as one of the most influential and richest people in the world. He was also a legendary playboy and an often emotionally and physically abusive man who seduced, harassed and cajoled scores of famous actresses, including Ava Gardner, Betty Davis, Lana Turner and more. Disclaimer. I am not sure what is true or false in this video. I just find the information about a celebrity and make videos. This is not a biography channel and it is just for entertainment purposes only. Please do not take any information from this video as factual. Thanks. Howard Hughes was born on December 24, 1905, in Houston, Texas. He was the only child of Howard Robard Hughes and Aline Gano Hughes. His father earned millions by inventing special machinery for the oil industry. His mother was a Dallas debutante and the aristocratic granddaughter of a Confederate general. Hughes had an emotionally incestuous relationship with his mother that contributed to what would become his nearly crippling obsessive-compulsive disorder. Hughes idolized his mother and didn't spend a night away from her until he was 10 years old, while attending a summer camp. His mother, anxious over her son being away from her and worried about his possible exposure to germs, became obsessed with the idea of him contracting polio while at the camp and wrote several meddling letters to the camp counselors expressing her concerns. His mother checked him for diseases every day and was very careful about what he ate. She is said to have carefully monitored his feet, teeth, and bowel movements, and would take him to the doctor immediately if anything alarmed her. In Hollywood 1921, bisexual film director William Desmond Taylor, Mexican-born film star Ramon Novaro, Spanish-born star Antonio Moreno, and a 16-year-old Howard Hughes were all involved with each other sexually, sometimes all at the same time. Taylor was mesmerized by Hughes, who was attending a private school east of Santa Barbara, and planned to star him in a film custom tailored for him. Howard's uncle, Rupert Hughes, a powerful Hollywood screenwriter, was to write the script. It was Uncle Rupert who had introduced Howard to William Desmond Taylor. Included in their circle was silent film star Blanche Sweet, who regularly gave Howard blowjobs, marveling at the young man's generous endowment. But it was Taylor who became completely obsessed with Howard. He knew he could make Hughes the biggest star in all of Hollywood, and he couldn't keep his hands off him. Unfortunately, Taylor was murdered in 1922, and the case remains one of the great unsolved mysteries of Hollywood. Immediately after Taylor's funeral, Hughes abandoned plans to become a movie star. He told Sweet and Moreno that he had decided to become a producer, a field in which he could be the boss. He was also handsome, tall, 6 feet 3 inches, well endowed and rich, and accustomed to getting his way. Howard lived a warped reality of instant gratification. He played by no one's rules, sampling whatever drugs, alcohol, women and men he fancied. Hughes, the son of a fabulously wealthy father, lived on an open-ended allowance, enabling him to buy cars and wildly expensive clothes for his boyfriends. One of the most important of them, Dudley Sharp, was later involved in an affair with Howard's doting mother, who became pregnant by Dudley. In Houston, Aline, Howard's mother, died from complications of the pregnancy, and a day later Dudley, Howard's boyfriend from just a few years before, before he attempted suicide. Howard and his father took these unsavory complications in stride and immediately returned to California to live their lives of unbridled excess. Hughes Sr. continued his torrid affairs with Gloria Swanson and Eleanor Boardman and had Howard moved into a private bungalow at a Pasadena polo club, all paid for by his father, of course. Howard's father bribed officials at Caltech to accept his son, who did not have a high school diploma, as an uncredited student. Such was the power of money. Its corrupting influence was not lost on Howard. After accepting a sexual offer from silent film star Billy Haynes, Howard bragged to Haynes that he had received intimate invitations from both Eleanor Boardman and Charlie Chaplin. Haynes felt he should warn Howard that Boardman was one of Howard Sr.'s mistresses. Howard told Haynes that he was aware of that, and it would make taking her all the sweeter. When Howard Sr. found out about it, he actually encouraged the affair, even telling Boardman that he was pleased by his son's brazenness. Unknown to Boardman was the fact that Howard Sr. wanted to move on, focusing his attention on Gloria Swanson. 
Haynes and Hughes forged a close friendship, even though Billy Haynes was 100% gay and Hughes was bisexual. Billy knew everybody in Hollywood and made sure Hughes was invited to all the right parties. Haynes was also a close friend of Eleanor Boardman. In fact, both Haynes and Boardman had been winners of their respective divisions of the New Faces of 1922 contest sponsored by Goldwyn Pictures. Both were sent from New York to Hollywood for screen tests, and both became big stars. Upon arrival in Los Angeles, Boardman was already an established stage actress, but Billy Haynes was 100% raw talent. At a New Year's Eve party in Houston, Howard's father had humiliated him in front of other guests. After a heated argument about aviation, Hughes Sr. yelled at his son, just like your uncle Rupert, you're nothing but a queer. Turns out Hughes Sr. knew all about both his son's and brother's sexual dalliances with men. Howard collapsed into tears as his father slammed the door and stormed off. It is important to note that the person into whose arms Howard collapsed was none other than Dudley Sharp, father of his mother's unborn child, as well as being Howard's boyhood lover. For two weeks Hughes Sr. and his son kept an icy distance from each other. On January 14, 1924, Howard's father died suddenly of an embolism while working in his Houston office. When Howard was approached on the golf course to be told that his father had died, the first thing he did was call the family attorney. He asked the lawyer to read him his father's will. Howard had just turned 18. According to his father's will, Howard had been left with 75% of the Hughes Tool Company, not what Howard had in mind. He badgered his grandparents, aunts and uncles into selling him their stock so that he would have complete control of the company. He even engaged in homosexual activity with his uncle Rupert in order to have Rupert petition his stubborn parents into selling. This became the norm to Howard, he'd use whatever ammunition it took to accomplish his task, usually in the form of sex combined with lots and lots of cash. He was also young, rich, handsome and virile at a time when the Hollywood lifestyle was a temple to debauchery, and Hughes was at its epicenter. As a schoolboy, Howard had been rebuffed by a young girl named Ella Rice, daughter of the prominent Houston family for whom Rice University is named. When Howard was six years old, Ella had humiliated him by returning his Valentine card. Howard vowed to get even with her someday. Fast forward to 1925, when Howard was back in Texas tending to business at the Hughes Tool Company. Ella was still around, and Howard hatched a plan to woo her, then humiliate her. Trouble was, she was now engaged to a fellow known as James Winston. James never knew what hit him. Howard focused all his attention on James, seduced him, gifted him with a yellow Dwesenberg and an envelope containing $25,000 and it worked like a charm. With James Winston out of the way, Ella and Howard were married on June 1, 1925. Dudley Sharp was Howard's best man. At the age of 19, Howard owned 100% of the Hughes Tool Company and had talked a young lady, who had humiliated him when he was a child, into marrying him. He was just getting warmed up. Later Howard told his Hollywood pal Billy Haynes that, on the day of the wedding, I was so nervous I had to get sucked off by Dudley to calm my nerves before the ceremony. Just after the ceremony, while embracing Dudley in private, Howard said, you should never have let me go through with the ceremony. Ella will never mean as much to me as you do. While on his honeymoon on Long Island, Howard wrote to Dudley, my marriage is a disaster. Ella and I are not sexually compatible. Upon returning to Los Angeles, the first person Hughes called was Billy Haynes, who asked, are you a state old married man now, or can we go out on the town and raise hell? Hughes answered that he was married in name only. Upon checking into the same hotel where his father had bedded countless women, Howard asked to be placed in a suite with separate bedrooms, instead of the honeymoon suite, which had been reserved. Hughes left his newlywed to her own devices and went out with Haynes, not returning until 8 o'clock the next morning. Thus began a time of protracted humiliation of Ella. By this time, Hughes was already displaying eccentric traits that would dominate his later years. He seldom shook anyone's hand for fear of germs. He was later to display obsessive-compulsive behavior of such exaggerated proportions that it boggles the mind. He was also dealing with a serious loss of hearing. Hughes had a brief affair with Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., who went on to marry Joan Crawford. After their divorce, Miss Crawford forever rebuffed Howard's requests for a date. Said Joan, I adore homosexuals, but not in my bed after midnight. 
Howard was somewhat alarmed to learn that he had quite the reputation as a bisexual around Hollywood. Hughes formed a Hollywood film production company and scoured the town for star material. He had uncompromising taste in beauty. He didn't care if a person was male or female, Howard just had to have whoever was the handsomest, the most beautiful. For three years Hughes maintained a sexual relationship with a young, upcoming Gary Cooper, buying him cars, clothes and other lavish gifts along the way. Cooper's eventual replacement was a young, blonde William Boyd, later known to millions as Hopalong Cassidy. Obsessed with aviation and moviemaking, in 1927 Hughes began shooting an epic film about fighter pilots, Hell's Angels, that would not be completed until 1930, an astonishing circumstance at a time when the average film was completed in three or four weeks. Hughes, who made the film with $3.8 million of his own money, directed the dogfight scenes himself and performed some of the aerial stunts. Amazingly, the film went on to earn a $4 million profit and made Gene Harlow a star. The next few years were a blur of activity. By 1928 Hughes had his pilot's license. Two Arabian Nights, a film Hughes produced, won an Academy Award in 1929. Howard and Ella, who had been separated for over a year, divorced in 1929. Hughes decided that Hell's Angels would have to be a talking film and reshot all the scenes with dialogue, doubling the film's cost. He was seriously injured in a plane crash while making Hell's Angels. Moving on, Howard founded the Hughes Aircraft Company in 1932, and Hughes was chasing fame and fortune with unbridled zeal. And he did all of this at age 27. By the 1930s Howard learned that sharing details of his private life could get him into trouble. Soon Cary Grant became his only confidant, a friend to whom he could tell anything. Since Grant himself was miles deep in the closet, this was a safe policy. Hughes soon became obsessed with his own privacy, and like most things in his life, he carried it to wild extremes. After the plane crash, Hughes had plastic surgery, and his looks changed considerably, and not for the better. Even so, Hughes was able to entice the 6 feet 4 inches tall newcomer to Hollywood, Randolph Scott, into an affair. Turns out their fathers had been friends back in the day. When Scott was out trolling for male flesh one night in Griffith Park, a popular place for gay cruising, he propositioned a vice cop and was arrested. Hughes bailed him out and paid a $3,000 bribe to make the arrest disappear. Scott was grateful but eventually moved on to Cary Grant, with whom he would have a long-term, volatile relationship. However, Gene Harlow claimed that Hughes had three signed photographs of Randolph Scott in his bedroom and stared at them in order to become aroused while having sexual intercourse with her. During a heated argument with Billy Dove, whom Howard intended to marry, she called him a gay slur. Things started to go south for Howard in a big way. After the plane crash he started having debilitating migraine headaches and his hearing loss worsened. He was having more and more frequent bouts of impotence, especially with women. He started to use cocaine, and he suffered a nervous breakdown, to boot. Once the best-dressed man in Hollywood, Hughes began to appear in public in wrinkled, sloppy clothes. Hughes was also becoming involved in dealings with the mob, particularly Bugsy Siegel. Even worse, Howard turned into a scathing bigot, disdainful of Jews and blacks. Howard was blackmailed by Billy Dove's husband to the tune of $350,000 and Hughes paid up. By the early 1930s Hughes had blown through most of the profits of the Hughes Tool Company. He had used the company's earnings to bankroll a string of money-losing projects in aviation and film production. However, his taste in the handsomest men in Hollywood continued unabated, Robert Taylor, Tyrone Power, George O'Brien, Johnny Mac Brown and many, many others. When Clark Gable first arrived in Hollywood, he dropped for several influential men, including Billy Haynes and Howard, anything to get ahead and become a star. When uber-gay George Cukor was directing Gable in Gone with the Wind, he teased him about his earlier dalliances with Haynes and Hughes. Gable never spoke to Cukor again while on the set, and he led a successful effort to get Cukor fired. Ava Gardner recalled Howard Hughes as a great lover, referring to him as the man who taught me that making love didn't always have to be rushed. But his anger often eclipsed his passion, as Gardner, then in her early 20s, learned the hard way after refusing to accompany Hughes' driver to pick him up from the airport. After telling Hughes she had been with her ex-husband, actor Mickey Rooney, instead, Hughes lost control. He swung at her, and the next thing she knew, she had fallen back into a chair. 
Then, she recalled, Hughes jumped at me and started to pound on my face until it was a mess. Gardner, however, fought back. She found an ornamental bronze bell on the mantelpiece, picked it up and struck him on his face, splitting his forehead open and knocking loose two teeth. Livid at what he'd done to her, Ava continued the beating while Howard was down, grabbing a chair and hitting him some more. Finally, her maid walked in and put a stop to it. Hughes and actress Catherine Hepburn were kindred spirits who would skinny dip by diving off the wing of a seaplane in the middle of Long Island Sound. They also shared a robust sex life, with Hepburn calling him the best lover I ever had. Betty Davis was equally enamored, if not entirely impressed, with Hughes' seductions. I was the only one who ever brought Howard Hughes to a sexual climax, or so he said at that time, she once claimed. I believed it when he told me that. I was wildly naive at the time. It may have been his regular seduction gambit. Anyway, it worked with me, and it was cheaper than buying gifts. Hughes and Ginger Rogers' on-again and off-again love affair lasted years, with Hughes gifting her a five-carat emerald engagement ring in 1940 and telling her he would build her a mansion. Soon, though, he demanded that Rogers be available for him whenever he desired, and she began to suspect he was having her followed and that her phone calls were being surveilled. After Hughes blamed Rogers for a car accident, she wasn't even in, she had refused to accompany him to a dental appointment, and he was so angry about this that he crashed his car, she finally broke it off. Howard wanted to get himself a wife, build her a house and make her a prisoner in her own home while he did what he pleased, Rogers later wrote. Thank heavens I escaped that. As Hughes got older, his targets became younger, his controlling nature more severe. Hughes was 35 when he met Faith Domerg, then 16 and an actress under contract with Warner Brothers, at a party on his yacht. After taking her out for a private sail, Hughes pursued her relentlessly. While she initially had no interest, he wore her down and proposed marriage three months later, giving her a diamond ring and telling her, you are the child I should have had. In time, his pet's name for her became Little Baby, her loving nickname for him was Father Lover. The pair never married, it turned out, were a primary tool in Hughes' seduction arsenal, but within weeks of his proposal, he purchased her contract from Warner Brothers Domerg later recalled, I and my emotional and professional destiny were completely in his hands. Hughes scheduled her life so completely, from acting lessons to school tutoring, that he controlled it all. He hired her as a full-time driver who was charged with writing down everywhere she went. He also moved her parents into a house around the corner from him, charming and bribing them with his largesse and giving her father and grandfather jobs in his factories. Soon, she no longer had friends, wasn't allowed to drive herself anywhere, was trapped alone. Hughes rarely returned home in a 30-room mansion she found haunted and creepy and had her family completely in Hughes' debt. Hughes, who carried on with Gardner, Turner and a then-teenage Gloria Vanderbilt while still with Domerg, would never marry her or make her a star. He didn't cast her in a movie for years and since he owned her contract, she couldn't act for anyone else. Whenever she tried to leave him, Hughes would appeal to her mother, who would pressure her into staying. Years later, Domerg wrote an autobiography that was never published. Whenever he saw a picture of a pretty teenage actress, he sought to get her under contract and under his full control right away, installing them in his apartments, scheduling every moment of their lives and hiring each a personal driver who was also his spy. He would then leave very specific demands for how these women were to be handled, some of which revealed odd sexual proclivities. Hughes was one of the world's consummate breast men, and he was convinced that women's breasts would sag dangerously unless treated gently and supported at all times. Stories of Hughes' pursuits are a litany of creep, including that of actress Terry Moore when he was 43 and she was 19. As she wouldn't sleep with him until they were married, Hughes married her on a boat but did so in international waters. Records of the wedding mysteriously disappeared after the ceremony, and the dispute over whether they were ever really married led to a years-long legal battle after his death. When Hughes saw a picture of 23-year-old Italian beauty Gina Lalo Brigida in 1950, his representatives offered plane tickets for her and her husband to fly to L.A. to meet Hughes but sent only one ticket. When she arrived in L.A., believing it to be the beginning of a career in Hollywood, she was provided a hotel room with guards outside her door. Unless accompanied by Howard, she wasn't allowed to leave the room, and Hughes had arranged with the front desk to block her phone calls. When Lalo Brigida finally had the chance to talk business with Hughes after a month and a half as a virtual captive, he tried to persuade her to divorce her husband and marry him. 
She demanded a plane ticket home, but before she left, Hughes insisted on throwing her a goodbye party. He once persuaded a drunken Lalo Brigida to sign a contract. While she went on to become a major star in Europe, her fame did not immediately cross the ocean because due to the contract she had signed, she was forbidden for years from working in America for anyone but Hughes. Given his behavior, she refused to work with him. Hughes, famously reclusive and mentally ill in his later years, died in 1976 at age 70. By the end of Hughes' life, when he was a coding addict who spent his days and nights nodding in front of the TV. The former star aviator Playboy would suddenly perk up when an actress he had once spent time with appeared on the screen. Hughes would allegedly call over one of his many aides, point, and say, remember her, and then drift off into a grinning daydream of better days, days when his power to draw women to him and control not just their emotions but their movements, appearances and identities was apparently limitless. Howard's attention drifted away from making films to the field of aviation. He became more and more eccentric. For example, all he would eat was rare steak and peas, and he started buying his clothes from thrift stores. He became hopelessly paranoid and insanely jealous of anyone who threatened to topple him from the mountaintop. Hughes went on to design and manufacture aircraft and forever changed the face of Las Vegas. However, his life from this point was a sad lapse into mental illness, self-destruction, and bizarre behavior, much of it too unsavory to relate. A second plane crash in 1946 left him scarred and addicted to morphine. He ran RKO pictures into the ground and did much the same with Trans World Airlines. He later fled to the Bahamas and Mexico to have easier access to codeine, which he personally injected into his arms. He also suffered the effects of tertiary syphilis. His legacy was that of the world's most eccentric billionaire, and today only his medical research institute carries his banner in a positive light. Because of his wealth and power, his homosexual proclivities were not well known to the public during his lifetime. However, enough of his employees and colleagues survived after his death in 1976 to be able to speak openly about the subject without fear of reprisal. Turns out they had plenty to talk about. Please like this video and subscribe, leave a comment and share this video. Thanks.